Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to the Law of Self-Defense show for today, Thursday, April 20th, 2023. I am, of course, attorney Andrew Branca for Law of Self-Defense. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. And today we are here to talk about, of course, of course, weaponized dogs. Uh, using dogs as weapons, which can be permissible, but unfortunately too often is lawful, uh, unlawful. And we're going to talk about the, uh, the legal boundaries and legal consequences for using dogs as weapons uh, based on a, uh, a really tragic, though not as tragic as it could have been, I suppose, uh, news event out of Ohio involving, surprise, surprise, pit bulls. Uh, so as always, folks, as we uh, make yourselves comfortable, please, if, um, if you're watching on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, hit the thumbs up, like button, uh, leave a comment, even if it's only your city and state, do all that same stuff on Rumble too. Uh, if during the course of the show, you'd like to pose a question or comment for me to address uh, personally, uh, the best way to do that, the least expensive way to do that, is as a Law of Self-Defense member. Um, Law of Self-Defense members who pose their questions in the member chat, we stream this show, every show live, to our Law of Self-Defense members, uh, can ask as many questions as they like there for absolutely no cost beyond their membership fee, uh, which is only about 30 cents a day, folks, less than $10 a month to be a member of Law of Self-Defense, and you get all your questions answered for free. Or uh, if you're not a Law of Self-Defense member, you're watching this on YouTube or Rumble, uh, you can post questions uh, there and uh, I'll answer them if they are a minimum $5 Super Chat or $5 Rumble Rant. And we'll get to those before the end of the show. So it's $5 a question or 30 cents a day for all the questions you want. You decide which way you'd like to go with that. Um, let me make sure we're streaming all the places we need to be streaming. YouTube is working correctly. Uh, let's see, Twitter is working correctly. Rumble. Uh, let's see. Is Rumble working? Yes, Rumble is working as well. All right, good. Everything is going correctly from a technical perspective. That's always always nice to hear. Now, I do have, a, of course, a couple of administrative things to cover before we jump in. Um, one is uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow's show, Friday's show, uh, I don't have it scheduled yet, but to give all of you a heads up, uh, we'll cover a bunch of recent uh, shooting events uh, where people are shot. Uh, every time I cover those on uh, YouTube, uh, the show gets demonetized, which means it's a pointless effort to put it on YouTube at all because YouTube does not promulgate, promote content that it can't make money off of. Uh, so I'm doing that show tomorrow, but I'm doing it uh, as a Law of Self-Defense members-only show. So this will be live-streamed, uh, but only to our Law of Self-Defense members. So if you'd like to enjoy... Uh, this shooting will cover, we're going to cover multiple shootings. I just have three listed here. Uh, the one on the left is the uh, the pickup truck kicking shooting uh, that I believe occurred down in Brazil, but of course we'll cover it in the context of American law as if it had happened here. Uh, the middle one here is a shooting by police in Farmington, New Mexico, which I just rode my motorcycle through a couple days ago, um, where police uh, went to the wrong address, uh, responding to a 911 call from an address at night, went to the wrong address, and as the police were realized they'd made a mistake or were walking away, the homeowner came out the front door and pointed a gun at them. So the police shot back, I believe, with, yeah, with fatal results. Uh, so we'll be covering the legal dynamics around that kind of shooting, that kind of um, unfortunate uh, course of events. The one on the right is the video footage we've all been seeing on Twitter about this uh, gentleman wearing an army jacket who got in a confrontation with a female officer who ended up shooting him uh, twice. Now, by all appearances, the army gentleman was unarmed. Uh, the two shots uh, appeared to have no effect, but he did, in fact, succumb to those wound, wounds and die. 
So we'll be covering the legal dynamics around that shooting. I have a couple of others too um, that I'll be adding, but I just couldn't fit them all in the graphic. But the point is, uh, that show, tomorrow's show, Friday's show, will be only for law self-defense members. So if you'd like to hear my legal commentary and analysis on those shooting events, 30 cents a day, folks, gets you a law self-defense membership. I would encourage you to do that right now. Open up a tab, lawselfdefense.com slash join. And if you decide it's not worth it, folks, you can quit anytime. Okay, let's see. Uh, also, coming up very quickly now, only about three weeks away, the spring semester for American law courses. These are our law school level courses uh, that we're teaching under the American Law Courses umbrella for lay people. Uh, these are taught, again, at a law school level by unbelievably qualified uh, professors. Uh, I, I'm really, I have to confess folks, when I started this American Law Courses idea, it was my intent to simply teach all these courses myself. They're first year law school courses I took all of them. I did very well in all of them. I'm, I'm competent in the subject matter, but I've been blessed. I've been blessed by a plethora of even more qualified people than myself who've been willing to teach these courses. The spring semester starts in uh, May 17th. So coming up very quickly, it's being taught by Professor uh, Linda Denno, who is a, a brilliant constitutional law professor. We're so unbelievably blessed to have her. We have criminal law taught by Steve Gosney. We have evidence. Uh, we have property law. We have all these first year law courses being taught at a law school level, but at a fraction of the cost of law school, a fraction of the time commitment, and without any of the political toxicity of today's law school environment. So if you'd like to be the best American citizen you can be because you've been taught and learned the law, and these courses do have final exams, folks, you've been taught the law at the highest possible level, uh, I would encourage you to take a look at AmericanLawCourses.com, especially this constitutional law class taught by a political conservative, folks, not by some crazy progressive liberal. You're not going to get that in most any law school in the country, AmericanLawCourses.com. And the final thing, which is just kind of a, a fun thing, of course, I've been talking about these American, uh, sorry, huh, law cards, law cards. Uh, and I finally got my personal set of uh, law cards. These are baseball type cards of your favorite law tubers. I got a, I got a bunch that are specific to me here. They were sent to me to sign. Now these, of course, it's kind of a gag gift thing, folks. It's just for fun, for giggles. Um, but I think. I think these are pretty cool. So let me share these with you. In fact, these, how many do I have here? I have five, five distinct cards, you know, types of cards. Of course, I guess I'll print hundreds or thousands of these things, but these five, I, I was sent a handful. I was sent about 20, I think, something like 20 um, to sign. So these will be autographed cards. Uh, I guess that's an option for those of you who'd like to get autographed cards. These five in particular, I'm going to show you, and I'm going to sign them, these five, only these five. I'm going to sign these live on the air right now. And you'll know these are the ones I signed because these will be the only cards that I will sign front and back. So I'm going to put my glasses on so I can read these myself. This is just a, a picture of me wearing my snazzy hat and sunglasses. This is taken right outside Law Self-Defense Headquarters here in Castle Rock, Colorado. I got my little gold pen and sign the front and sign the back. So folks, any of you who get this card will know it was signed live on the air by me today, April 20th, 2023. Here's another one of me just uh, it's looking like I look now, just talking on the microphone during a live show. And again, signed on the front, signed on the back. Here's a funny one. This is when my tie was taken at the uh, the Vegas meetup for uh, Nick, Nick Rakita, Rakita Law. Uh, that was a good tie, folks. It was, um, in fact, I believe it has my quote on it. On the back, 
It does. So I'll read it. It says in the back, uh, someone got a damn nice tie. I lost my tie in Vegas. Someone got my tie that night. I don't know who. It was a group effort, a group attack. Someone got a damn nice tie. It was an expensive tie. It was over 100 bucks, folks. Uh, I hope they enjoy it. Signed on the front and signed on the back. And these are all being produced by Farmhand Tom. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I didn't tell him I would be signing these on the air, so I'm not sure how he's going to... Uh, make these available, but I'll leave that up to him. Uh, one of me announcing the start of our $5 Super Chat requirement for YouTube and Rumble Rant. Questions? Front and back. And finally, finally, you know we couldn't have a set of cards without having a no tie Branca card. Right there, that's when things, the burns start flying when it's a no tie Branca show. And this one, and only this one, signed live on the air by me today, April 20th, 2023, on the front and on the back. So if you're interested in those folks, um, reach out to lawselfdefense.com slash law cards and uh, see what they have to offer. And it's not just me, of course, it's all the law tubers you, you love and uh, like. Uh, Nick's there, Joe's there. Uh, everybody you can think of, I believe, is, has been participating in this thing. It's, it's a fun idea, and I hope a bunch of you uh, take advantage of it. Okay, what do we have now? So we have this story of a, uh, a dog being used as a weapon. And this came to my attention I saw a tweet by Jack Basobic. Jack's uh, very uh, widespread on Twitter. Uh, he's a, a personal friend of mine. I like Jack a lot. Uh, and uh, he didn't send this to me personally, which, which of course is fine, but uh, that's why I saw it on my Twitter feed. Uh, it just reads, breaking Ohio woman sentenced to two years in jail for sicking her pit bull on a neighbor's six-year-old, yelling, your kids shouldn't have effed with me and my dogs. And uh, actually, that made me think that perhaps the kids had uh, provoked the attack upon themselves. I guess that's theoretically possible. But when we look at the actual news story, which I have here as well, uh, it's from the post-millennium. Uh, there's no indication of that. Uh, apparently, these uh, the dogs were just the woman just used the dogs as an offensive weapon against against children, children, folks, who were not doing anything to provoke the attack. So let's take a look at the actual news story. Uh, which I've, I've just pasted into a Word document so we don't have to look at all the ads. Um, Ohio woman sentenced to two years in jail for sicking her pit bulls on a six-year-old yelling, your kids shouldn't have effed with me and my dogs. So uh, multiple pit bulls involved here and a group of children. It looks like the six-year-old girl got the worst of it here. A woman's been sentenced to two years in jail, in jail, not in even prison, assuming the journalist knows what they're talking about, um, on charges of child endangerment, and her pit bulls will be euthanized after they mauled a six-year-old girl who, who miraculously survived. According to Warren County, Ohio, court documents, Cassie Theroff, 38, was living in a duplex in Lebanon, Ohio, and a six-year-old and her family lived on the other side of the duplex, I guess. So they shared a backyard, basically. Uh, although sometimes there's a fence going down the middle. Um, on August 25th, 2022, the 38-year-old and another man were in the backyard allegedly doing drugs when the family came outside. Drugs and pit bulls, folks. An unusual combination? Now, of course not. All pit bull owners are drug users or drug dealers. But it might be that all drug dealers are pit bull owners. Maybe. And of course, there's a reason why they own Pit bulls, drug dealers do, because drug dealers are frequent targets of, um, of attack, um, robbery, uh, theft. Why not, right? When drug dealers have everything that uh, bad guys like, they got drugs and money. So often, pit bulls will be taken on as less pets than security. Why? Because pit bulls are obviously extremely dangerous, lethal animals. That's why. There's a reason drug dealers don't uh, use chihuahuas for this purpose, folks. 
Uh, so allegedly the defendant here and uh, someone else, her boyfriend, another person, who, whoever was in the backyard allegedly doing drugs when the family came outside. So yeah, when you're living in a duplex with little kids next door, make sure you do your drugs out in the open in your backyard where everyone can watch you do it. The six-year-old's mother began to videotape the pair, which, uh, you know, drug dealers don't like that. Uh, Wayne County prosecutor David Fornshell said an argument began. And eventually the mother went inside to call the police. I guess she left her kids outside. While all this was happening in the backyard, the six-year-old, her sister, and a neighbor girl were in the front yard of the home playing. The six-year-old's father testified in court Wednesday, quote, the defendant called two dogs to attack four little girls who were out front. My six-year-old mauled by two of them, two of the dogs, while she stood there on her front porch watching. I guess while the defendant stood there on her front porch watching in a video obtained by the police. So not he said, she said. The defendant can be heard telling the girl's mother, your kids shouldn't have effed with me and my dogs. How bad can a six-year-old mess with anybody? The defendant pleaded guilty to child endangering charges. That's the best a prosecutor can come up with? Child endangering charges? As part of her plea agreement, but also denied the allegations made against her. Well, if you take the plea, you're not denying the charges. To take the plea, you have to concede the charges. That's how that works, folks. The defendant said, quote, I would never use my dogs in a malicious or threatening type of way towards anybody. This all occurred because I didn't shut my front door, close quote. Uh, she told the judge. Uh, the six-year-old girl was required to undergo multiple emergency surgeries as a result of bites to her head and body. You ever seen pit bull wounds, folks? Imagine when I've got a seven-year-old girl, daughter. Uh, the horror of that beautiful girl being subject to a pit bull attack on her head. You think that girl's ever going to look normal again? Ever? The judge said he did not believe the defendant and sentenced her to two years in jail with the possibility of two years probation. After she is released, the dogs will be humanely put down as they are considered contraband as a result of the case. Well, this article says the judge didn't believe the defendant, uh, but this the, the plea agreement suggests to me that he did believe her because if he believed that the door was accidentally left open and the dogs simply fled the property, uh, the dwelling on their own initiative and attacked the girls on their own initiative, that looks like child endangerment. That looks like she unintentionally created a risk of harm to the children living next door. And that harm resulted, but it was unintentional, reckless. So there's criminal liability. That looks like child endangerment. Like if you had left a, a box of, uh, you know, if you had left a, um, a gun accessible to a child or a knife or anything else dangerous. Now you didn't intend any harm, but creating, allowing, permitting, the dangerous situation. Uh, and, if, it, you know, if you have pit bulls, they're dangerous. So you need to keep them contained. And if you don't, that's on you. It's your responsibility to do that. So actually, this, this plea agreement looks to me like it's consistent with the judge believing that the dog simply got out an open door unintentionally, as opposed to um, what's claimed alternatively that the dogs were used as a weapon. And that's what that's what we're really here to talk about today. So can you use can you use a dog as a weapon? How's it different than using a gun as a weapon or a knife as a weapon or pepper spray as a weapon? That's what we're here to talk about today. So uh, the answer is, uh, of course, technically you can use a dog as a weapon, but are, are, are there circumstances in which that would be lawful? Well, first, let's look at the, the nature of the weapon, the nature of the dog. In theory, can you sick a chihuahua on somebody? I guess, right? Why not? I mean, dogs are trainable. Chihuahuas are trainable. I guess you could have a chihuahua guard dog, attack dog. A chihuahua attack dog, that would be interesting. Um, so sure, you could use it as a weapon. And if you use it as a weapon, uh, it's really no different than using anything else as a weapon. 
Uh, it's a little more complicated because, of course, when you're using an inanimate object as a weapon, um, the weapon, the force of the weapon is only applied when you choose to use it each and every time. If it's a gun, the force of the gun is applied when you press the trigger. If it's a knife, it's when you wield the knife. If it's a baton, it's when you swing the baton. A gun, a knife, and a baton are not autonomous. They don't make their own decisions about when they'll be used. Uh, and of course, dogs can. Um, you're not controlling each and every time that dog inflicts a bite, for example. Um, let's presume that the dog is doing nothing until you trigger it, that initial trigger. You say attack or whatever your trained word is for the dog to attack, sick, whatever. Um, you made that decision. And uh, But of course, you could lose control of the animal after that. Getting them to stop might be more difficult than getting them to stop. But in any case, you initiate the animal's attack, let's presume. Uh, it's no different than if you were initiating the use of any other weapon. Now, if it's an attack chihuahua, the prospects of a chihuahua causing death or serious bodily injury, uh, I would think are modest. I guess the teeth could still puncture skin. Would that be serious bodily injury? It's unlikely to be a maiming type of attack. Um, so we have a proportionality issue, right? If uh, Remember, generally speaking, you can only use non-deadly force if you're facing a non-deadly force attack. You can't use deadly force until you're facing a deadly force attack. So Chihuahua, let's pretend Chihuahua would be non-deadly force. You sick your attack Chihuahua on somebody. It's the use of non-deadly defensive force. That can be lawful if someone's threatening you with non-deadly force in the attack using non-deadly defensive force. It doesn't really matter if it's pepper spray or if it's uh, an attack Chihuahua. What if you're threatened with deadly force? Well, if you're threatened with deadly force, and of course, if the other conditions of self-defense are met, remember there's up to five elements, building blocks of any claim of self-defense or defense of others. Those are innocence, imminence, proportionality, avoidance, and reasonableness. These are the building blocks of any claim of self-defense justification. If you don't understand these folks, you can't possibly understand self-defense. And we give this to you for free. There's five elements of self-defense law cheat sheet, you can get it at lawofselfdefense.com slash elements, lawofselfdefense.com slash elements. Uh, just a PDF download. We don't charge a penny for that, folks. So uh, on that element of proportionality, threatened only with non-deadly force, you use non-deadly force in self-defense, that's fine, even if it's an attack chihuahua. If you're threatened with deadly force, you can use deadly defensive force, and that could be a gun, that could be a knife, uh, that could be a dog capable of inflicting death or serious bodily injury, such as a pit bull. So are there circumstances in which using a pit bull as a weapon against another human being could be lawful? Sure. If that other human being is threatening you or another person, another innocent person, with an unlawful, imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury, then you've met the conditions for the use of deadly defensive force, assuming you're perceiving that threat reasonably. Uh, and you could use deadly defensive force, whether that's a gun or a knife or an attack dog capable of inflicting death or serious physical injury. But that's the threshold. You have to have been facing a deadly force threat from that other person. And by the way, the threat from that other person has to be against you or another human, not against the dog. Dogs don't have a legal right to self-defense. I mean, it just, they're not going to be criminally charged. So a dog wouldn't be raising the legal justification of self-defense, right? Like a human being would in a court of law to justify a use of force. Um, so what we're talking about here is not the dog acting autonomously on its own, uh, but you using the dog as a weapon. If the dog acts autonomously, not by your orders, uh, then it's not an intentional use of the dog as a weapon. And self-defense would be irrelevant as a legal defense because self-defense inherently is an intentional act. You can only raise it as a legal defense if you concede you intended that use of force to occur. Uh, if the use of force occurred unintentionally, uh, then it can't be self-defense. And if it can't be self-defense, you can't justify it using the legal defense of self-defense. It would be like if you dropped the gun and it discharged and the bullet struck somebody. That wasn't an act of self-defense. You didn't intend to hit that person. 
Um, if, if you're walking in your house and your pit bull runs out the open door and attacks somebody, that wasn't you intentionally using force in that person. Now, might you be criminally liable anyway, despite lack of intent? And the answer is, yeah, it could be if, if your conduct would qualify as reckless. So if you knew you were creating an unjustified risk of death to some other person, you weren't intending death or serious bodily injury, but you knew that your conduct was creating that risk. You knew your dog tended to run past your legs when you went into the house through the door, for example. Um, then that could be recklessness. That's the definition of recklessness, creating an unjustified risk of death or serious bodily injury to others, and then the risk results. Uh, that would typically be, um, in, if they died from the attack, involuntary manslaughter. Uh, it could be um, reckless endangerment, typically felony reckless endangerment if the risk is death or serious bodily injury and the person didn't die. So, yeah, if, if you have dangerous things like guns or pit bulls, you have a heightened responsibility to ensure that they don't unnecessarily create a risk of death or serious bodily injuries to others. So the problem, of course, is what if you use your dog in circumstances, your, your deadly force dog, your attack pit bull, you use it as a weapon in circumstances where you weren't facing Another human being wasn't facing a threat themselves of unlawful death or serious bodily injury. Um, someone insults you. Someone's committing a simple trespass on your front yard. And you sick upon them, a dog readily capable of inflicting death or serious bodily injury, like an attack pit bull. Could that be a lawful use of force? No, that's no different than if you shot that person with a gun for simple trespass. And simple trespass meaning someone's just walking on property without intent to commit any further crime. Um, simple trespass is, is not something you can use deadly force to prevent. You can use non-deadly force, but you can't use deadly force to prevent a simple trespass. And your use of your pit bull would certainly qualify as deadly force, force readily capable of causing death or serious bodily injury, the use of your pit bull to attack that person. What about if you just threaten to have the pit bull attack that person? Uh, well, that looks to me a lot like aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, just like if you were pointing a gun at that person and threatening to shoot them. You don't have the legal justification to do that if they're committing only a simple trespass. Um, now, what's shocking here is that this woman was allowed, allowed to plea merely to child endangerment. Again, this tells me that either uh, the prosecutor, so the prosecutor arranges the plea deal and the judge has to accept the plea deal. So uh, it, it seems to me that um, both of them, the prosecutor and the judge, must have either believed that the the dog's attack was unintentional by the owner, or they believed it would be difficult for them to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the dog's attack was the intent of the owner. I don't know. They have that video. It certainly doesn't seem to me that this defendant was going, oh, my gosh, my dog's got out. Save your kids. Save your kids. Not when there's a video of her saying, um, what is it? Your kids shouldn't have effed with me and my dogs. And again, there's no evidence that the kids approached the dogs or provoked the dogs or poked them with a stick or something that would have prompted an, um, an attack from the dogs. The kids were just pl playing in the opposite yard, uh, the front yard of the house. So uh, to me, uh, if, if, if I believed, and this certainly, this quote sounds like, um, your kids shouldn't have effed with me and my dogs, consistent with someone who intentionally used the dogs in the attack. Uh, this, that wouldn't strike me as uh, child endangerment. That would strike me as attempted murder and intentional maiming. And attempted murder, if convicted, generally carries the same sentence as if the murder had been successful. You don't get a break in sentencing because you are unsuccessful in your attempt to murder someone. So absolutely, absolutely terrible. And yeah, folks, I'm 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 firmly of the belief that um, that communities and states would be well within their rights, well within the general police power of a state to say these. There are certain breeds of dogs that are so consistently involved in violent, sometimes lethal attacks, even on grown ass people, much less small women. Uh, children, 
uh, that they don't belong in communities where women and children live. Even grown men killed by some of these breeds. And high on that list, of course, is pit bulls. Now, is every pit bull a vicious killer? No, of course not. Does every pit bull need to be a vicious killer before we say this is enough? This is enough. Nobody has to own a pit bull. There's lots of other breeds of dogs that make great pets, loving pets, great family dogs that don't have a demonstrable tendency to kill people and maim people and take limbs off of people. Now, listen, if you live up in, in the wilds of Montana, have all the pit bulls you want. I couldn't care less. But if you live in a community of other people with children playing in yards that are going to be maimed for life, a young girl's going to grow up with whatever face is left after a pit bull is done mauling her head. That's an inappropriate pet to have in a community any more than it would be inappropriate for someone to be leaving loaded guns around their front yard or their backyard where children could access them. So anyway, that's how I feel about pit bulls. I, I would encourage you, I, I know many of you have pit bulls. I get heat from you all the time. Uh, I would encourage you, if you own pit bulls, uh, please don't allow them anywhere near my kids because that won't be a good day for anybody. All right. Let me see if uh, any questions have come in. First, the law of self-defense members. Oh, and just a reminder, tomorrow's show is uh, a shooting show. I'm going to be covering a bunch of shooting videos, uh, but it's uh, because those just get demonetized every time I put them on uh, YouTube. Uh, I'm not going to bother. Uh, so tomorrow's show is going to be a members-only show, law of self-defense members only. I'll cover these three shooting events, the pickup truck kick, the Farmington, New Mexico, police went to the wrong house and end up gunning down the homeowner, shoot. And the uh, the unarmed, apparently unarmed army guy who um, threatened a female police officer got shot twice in the chest, walked leisurely away, and ultimately succumbed to his wounds and a couple of other shooting events. We'll be covering all of those in tomorrow's show, uh, but that'll be only for law self-defense members. So if, if you like that kind of content, legal analysis of actual shooting events, I would encourage you to become a Law Self-Defense member at lawselfdefense.com slash join. It's only about 30 cents a day, folks, less than $10 a month. And you get this kind of members-only content as well as the stuff we make publicly accessible. So let's see, uh, Law Self-Defense members. All the usual suspects here in the members-only chat. Um, yeah, something was going on. So someone mentions that our the video looks a little pixelated. It often looks pixelated when it first starts streaming, but we we definitely were having internet problems in the office earlier today. I think in the whole area, there was some kind of issue going on. Nothing I can do about that, folks. Uh, someone asks a uh, law self-defense member, couldn't these dogs be protected as arms under the Second Amendment? There is history and tradition to support that. Uh, I wouldn't make that argument, but I could see that argument being made. I suppose um, that would require a lot of historical research. Uh, by the way, I, I'm not fond of these uh, these <laughs> these comparisons between pit bulls and guns. It's like, well, you know, the argument you're using against pit bulls, uh, the same arguments that the gun control people use against guns. Uh, first of all, uh, <laughs> it's it's not at all clear that the Second Amendment would protect a dog as an arm. Uh, second of all, if anybody wants to own a pit bull that's as inanimate as my AR rifles, that's as inanimate as my pistols, feel free. I, I can even recommend a taxidermist. If, if your pit bull's incapable of making its own independent decision to maim and kill women and children, fine. Then there's no danger. I have no problem with that. Own all the inanimate pit bulls you like around kids and women. Uh, someone mentions that an attack chihuahua might be concealed carry. That's very funny. I like that. Uh, let's see. Oh, yes. Uh, Chuck, law self-defense member Chuck mentions, I've OC sprayed a few dogs over the years. So, yeah, that's worth talking about, too. So, 
what if you're attacked by a dog, right? You're the victim of a, let's call it a pit bull attack. Um, um, now, I talk about this element of proportionality, right? If all you're facing is a non-deadly force attack, you can only use non-deadly force. If you're facing a deadly force attack, you can use deadly defensive force. But these elements, folks, apply to the use of force against humans because the state has an interest in protecting human life. These are not requirements for the use of force against animals. I mean, if you shoot and kill an animal, you're not charged with murder, right? It's a different crime. So a different set of public policies, a different set of public concerns. Uh, the, the legal defenses of self-defense, defense of others, are applicable in the context of you've used force against another human being or threatened to do that, and you've been charged with a use of force crime as a result against another human being. But those are not conditions. Uh, these five elements are not conditions for the use of force against a non-human being, against an animal. If you've used force against an animal, uh, you may be charged with a criminal offense, right? We, it's against the law to just walk around shooting dogs. Um, there are constraints. There, there might also be a charge if you, if you like discharge a gun against a dog in a community where other people live, you may find yourself increasingly common, in my experience, charged with uh, felony reckless endangerment because that bullet goes someplace, right? Uh, does it stay inside a dog? Uh, maybe, maybe not. But every shot you fire in a community is potentially a threat to other people in the community. And it's one thing if you're doing that out of necessity to save your life uh, from an attacking human being, it, it's often prosecutors become and that would apply, too, if you were saving your life from a deadly force attack from a dog. Uh, you'd be privileged to use deadly defensive force. Uh, but sometimes the, the prosecutors show up and they're like, eh, we, we don't buy it. We, we think you just shot the dog because you were mad at it, because it's a pest in the neighborhood, not because it was actually representing a deadly force threat. Uh, so we're going to charge you with felony, reckless endangerment for that round you fired in the community. Increasingly common folks, even, even against like off-duty cops or with their dogs uh, and are attacked by some, you know, unleashed uh, pit bull in the area. Um, so if you're not, so you, you've shot at a dog or you've shot a dog that was attacking you because you feared harm, uh, what would be, and you're charged with a crime as a result, um, cruelty to animals or felony reckless endangerment towards other humans in the community. If your legal defense to justify that use of force by you, that use of defensive force, is not self-defense or defense of others, what would be the technical legal defense? It would, almost certainly it would be what we call the necessity defense, sometimes called the doctrine of lesser evils or the doctrine of lesser harms. Uh, and this is a, every state has this, this is a completely independent alternative legal defense that you would raise against a criminal charge separate from the legal defenses of self-defense and defense of others that are defined by these five elements. And the elements of the necessity defense are different. Uh, generally, what the necessity defense requires is that uh, although you concede that you committed what would normally be some criminal offense, some wrong, you committed some harm, you shot somebody's dog, uh, that, you, that, that, that harm that you caused is offset by a much greater harm that was avoided by your conduct. So the harm that was avoided is much less, uh, sorry, the harm that was avoided is much greater than the much lesser harm you committed. Hence the doctrine of lesser harms or the doctrine of lesser evils. Uh, and a, an illustration of this that may be clear is something like you're, you're walking along a, a sidewalk in a hot summer day, cars are parked along the sidewalk. And in one of those cars, you see a baby in a baby seat uh, with all the windows in the car rolled up, it's 100 degrees out, the baby's in clear distress, it will die if it stays in that car. The doors are locked, you look around, you don't see anybody who could potentially be the owner. So you break the glass of the window to extract the baby from the car, saving the baby's life. Now, is the breaking of the window a crime? Sure. I mean, it's, it's criminal mischief, right? Destruction of someone else's property. You're not allowed to just go around and break car windows. Uh, that would be a crime. But the crime you committed, the harm you committed, is much less than the harm that was avoided, the saving of the baby's life. And therefore, uh, we would say that your breaking of the window isn't so much justified as it is excused, legally excused, under the doctrine of necessity, uh, the doctrine of lesser harms. 
So that's the necessity defense. Uh, so that's the defense you would raise if you if you shot a dog because you feared it was going to harm you. Um, it, you're not being charged with the use of force crime towards people, uh, so you wouldn't raise self-defense. You'd be raising the necessity defense. Sure, it's normally wrong to shoot someone else's dog, uh, but the harm I caused was much less than the harm I avoided, being maimed or killed by the dog. Um, and this could apply too um, if you're even even if you're just defending not yourself, uh, but your dog, your own dog. Say you're walking your dog. Say you're walking your dog, and you're attacked by a human. The, the, your dog is attacked by a human, right? So some human walks up with a baton and starts striking your dog. Well, I know everyone who owns pets feels like those pets are just as much a member of the family as the humans in the family, maybe more than the humans in the family, I guess, depending on the humans in your particular family. But your pet legally is personal property. And outside of Texas, you're not allowed to use deadly force in defense of personal property. So if someone's threatening, har harming your dog, they're harming your personal property, just as if they were using that baton on the hood of your unoccupied car. Now, are you allowed to use force in, in defense of your property? You are, but only non-deadly force, not deadly force. So shooting that person who's hitting your dog with a baton, using deadly defensive force to stop an attack on mere personal property would be unlawful, would be disproportional, could not be justified as self-defense. You know, the argument you'd want to be able to make there is that, sure, that guy started by attacking my dog, but it was obvious to me I made a reasonable inference that I would be next, and therefore I was actually defending myself with deadly force, not just defending the dog with deadly force. Um, but if all that was threatened was the dog, say, say that your dog wasn't on a leash, he was at a distance, so the aggressor could not be an immediate threat to you with the baton, use of deadly force would not be justified against another human being to defend your dog. But it could be justified to defend your dog against a dog or from a dog. So you 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 would you see your dog at a distance as being attacked by another dog and however, for whatever reason, you have the means to reach out with a firearm and take out that attacking dog. Yeah, that could be lawful, even if you're doing it only to protect your dog. Because again, you're protecting your personal property, but you're protecting it from an animal, not from another human being. Okay, let's see. Back to the questions here. Yeah, see right here, Law Self Defense uh, member Brian in the comments. I'm not a fan of pit bulls, but you're getting uncomfortably close to the less argument against assault weapons. Uh, well, no, there, there's no there's no case law that dogs would qualify as being protected under the Second Amendment. So first of all, you don't have a Second Amendment privilege to own a pit bull. Um, also, of course, guns are inanimate. They can't cause harm without being directed by a human being to do so. There's no such thing as gun violence. Guns don't self-animate and harm people. A human is making that decision. That's not true with pit bulls. In fact, every pit bull owned by a human who goes and maims and kills something, someone, the first thing the human says is, oh, I had no idea he was going to do that. It's not my fault. I didn't command that which you can't say when you're handling a gun. So they're simply not comparable. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and, and I know other breeds bite people. In fact, Chihuahuas may be very high on the list of breeds that bite people. Um, but, you know, a nip from a Chihuahua is not the issue, folks. The issue is death and maiming. Very few people, very few people need multiple rounds of emergency surgery because they were maimed by a chihuahua. Let's see. Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, Kane, law self-defense member Kane. When I was nine, we found a stray dog. I only had it a couple days. But our 12-year-old neighbor came on our yard, and I told the dog to attack, just joking around. I didn't know. It knew the command. So I guess this stray dog attacked the 12-year-old. Uh, Could I or my parents be charged or convicted? Um, well, you'd have I don't think so. I mean, first of all, if you genuinely didn't know that the outcome of your command would be an attack, you didn't actually command an attack. You didn't intentionally command an attack. 
Um, and, uh, you know, but if you knew you were doing something wrong, wrongful, then in, in theory, your parents could be held criminally responsible. Sure. Uh, George, law self-defense member George question. Remember the guy who defended himself by shooting a guy whose dogs were attacking him and he still got convicted because he used a 10 millimeter handgun. Yes, I, I'm quite familiar with that case. Um, this was a, a, a general, uh, Fish, Harold Fish is the case. I believe it was out of Arizona. Um, and Harold Fish was walking along a hiking trail. Um, and it was a kind of trail where it wasn't easy to move left or right off the trail due the, to the geography. Uh, you really had to walk either straight forward or back. And ahead of him emerged uh, a gentleman uh, with a bunch of dogs. And the, the gentleman, I think the guy might have been homeless and had a bunch of stray kind of fear old dogs with him. Um, but the dogs charged at Harold Fish um, very aggressively, according to Fish, uh, so much so that Fish uh, drew his 10 millimeter 1911 style pistol, fired around, uh, I believe, into the ground as kind of a warning shot to scare the dogs. Uh, and the, the gentleman who was with the dogs uh, may have believed that Harold Fish shot one of the dogs. In any case, that gentleman charged Harold Fish, very large man. Harold Fish was not a young man. Um, and this large, young aggressor was charging at him, and Harold Fish um, shot him in the chest uh, with the 10 millimeter. Uh, and as you might expect, it was a, a fatal wound. Uh, and Harold Fish did all the right things. He tried to make the guy as comfortable as possible. He didn't die immediately. And Harold Fish went to get help. He had to hike to get help. Uh, and of course, it was too late by that point. But he, you know, Harold Fish called the police and so forth. But the prosecutor decided to uh, uh, charge and prosecute Harold Fish. And they, during the trial, the prosecutor made a huge deal out of the fact that Harold Fish used a 10 millimeter to commit this shooting. I guess to suggest some kind of animus. And, and is that a serious argument? Not to anyone who's familiar with guns. I mean, would it really have made a difference if Harold Fish had shot him with a 9 millimeter as opposed to a 10 millimeter? But anything you do that looks at all unusual or could be made to look unusual is, is a hook it's a building block for a narrative of malice, a narrative of guilt by a prosecutor. It's why I always urge folks to, you know, when you're choosing your defense of weapons, obviously survival comes first. You have to pick stuff that you believe will work um, as well as handguns ever work in self-defense against large attackers. Um, but within that context of making sure, you know, you're, you're picking stuff that's capable, equipment that's capable, try to be as boring as possible. Uh, don't pick exotic stuff, weird looking guns, odd calibers. It's all just, it's stuff for the prosecutor to talk about. And even, even if you believe your defense attorney can mitigate whatever harm would come from this discussion of calibers, um, when that, when the prosecutor is looking at that investigative report about the event, if he sees weird stuff to talk about, um, that alone makes it look more interesting to him. Most of his work is really boring. It's the same type of cases over and over again. And now he's got a chance to weave an interesting story in front of a jury. Sure, you've just made yourself a more attractive target for prosecution. Not on the legal merits, but just because it's become more interesting to the prosecutor. And prosecutors decide what cases go to trial, independent of legal merit. So that's how that works. Let's see. Uh, Robert, law of self-defense member Robert asks, Andrew, what would be the legalities of using deadly defensive force against the owner of a pit bull sicking him, sicking him on me? Um, so clearly an owner of a pit bull who's using it as a weapon using it presumably as a deadly force weapon is initiating an unlawful act of deadly force against you, just as if he were discharging a gun at you. Uh, now, the, the a complication here, of course, is that if he's doing it with a pit bull and you shoot him, um, is the pit bull likely to stop attacking you? Will that end the use of force against you? Um, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, would the pit bull run back to his fallen owner and leave you alone? Would the pit bull redouble its efforts to attack you because you attacked its owner? I'm not sure how that works. I'm not sure anybody could know 
what the outcome would be. But it's obviously different than if he's shooting a gun at you. If he's shooting a gun at you and you shoot him and make him incapable of operating the gun, you've stopped the deadly force threat against you. If he sticks a pit bull or two or three on you, uh, he's using deadly force against you and you can use deadly force in defense. But if you shoot him, does the attack stop? I mean, just from a practical perspective, ha have you solved the problem of staying alive, of staying unmaimed? I'm not sure you have. I might a prosecutor say, hey, you know, ultimately self-defense needs to be necessary to stop a threat. And this wasn't going to stop the threat. So it doesn't qualify as self-defense. I could easily imagine a prosecutor making that argument. Uh, my focus would be on what's about to hurt me, which is the dogs. Uh, let's see. Uh, and again, uh, I, I should mention, someone says, uh, my cousin is anti-gun. This is law self-defense member Cheeky. My cousin is anti-gun, but a dog lover. Should I send this article to her and say, ban all pit bulls? Uh, I'm not really saying ban all pit bulls, folks. I, I just don't think they're safe animals to have around other humans. To have around, especially children, small women, elderly men. Uh, I, I just don't think it's a good idea. I think it's dangerous. Uh, you live on a farm someplace or you live in Montana or there's not a lot of other people around that could be threatened or harmed by the animal? Sure, go ahead. Own them. Okay, let's take a look at Super Chats. This is on YouTube, so if you're on YouTube, by the way, if you're on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button, the thumbs up button, uh, and leave a comment. Even if it's just your city and state, that helps fool the YouTube algorithm into sharing our content more broadly. Uh, if you're on Rumble, the same things, whatever those functions are in Rumble, you know, subscribe, like, leave a comment, city and state. Always appreciated. Uh, let's see. Uh, Farmhand Tom is in the comments. $20 Super Chat. Thank you very much. Um, he writes, how about 25 unique Branca cards in total? So, folks, I showed you uh, five five of the cards. Farmhand Tom is organizing all this law card stuff. Uh, he sent me a bunch of cards to uh, autograph. I uh, These five I autographed live on the air during the show. And these are the only cards I'll ever autograph front and back. So you'll know if you get one of these that it was signed today on the air on this show. Uh, and uh, Farmhand Tom says, how about 25 unique Branca cards in total? I guess that's how many he's made. Uh, I would just encourage you to go go there to the, um, the law cards page. Uh, I've set up a shortcut URL that's easy to remember. It's lawofselfdefense.com slash law cards. And that will uh, show you, uh, that'll bring you to the appropriate website and show you all the options, all the options, including this very nice card here. So I would encourage you to take advantage of that. They really are a lot of fun. Uh, YouTube, Kingslayer Damocles, $5. Thank you very much. Says, do you feel like German Shepherds in Belgium, Belgian Malinois also pose a deadly force threat as they often bite their handling officers and are large? You know, I think it's worthy of study. Uh, it, this is not a pit bull thing specifically. It would be the same as people were owning lions or leopards as pets. If there's data to suggest that the pet has an unusually high propensity to kill and maim human beings, I, I don't think it belongs in a community. That's all. Whatever the pet is. Could be a boa constrictor. Could be scorpions. I, I, I don't care. Uh, I just don't see any good reason to have animals with a propensity to kill and maim children, women, elderly uh, in a normal community. And I just don't think it's a good idea. Um, but it's not it's not breed specific to me. Uh, Bobby C on YouTube, $5 Super Chat, thank you very much, writes, about pit bulls, do they have a genetic predisposition to violence or are they being conditioned that way? I could understand a ban if it was genetic. Uh, you know, Bobby, to me, it doesn't, it doesn't matter in the sense of, yes, if they're genetically predisposed, then there'd be nothing you could do. They're just inherently dangerous, right? I don't know if that's true or not, uh, but if that were true, uh, then I just don't see how, how you they could be safe to own around other people. 
But even if they don't have a genetic predisposition, even if they have to be abused to become dangerous to humans, the reality is that they are. A lot of people buy them, especially people like drug dealers, and maybe they do deliberately abuse the pit bull so it becomes dangerous. But to the public, we can't tell. We see a pit bull jogging down the road in front of our HOA and there's kids playing everywhere. How are we supposed to know if it was well brought up or if it's about to kill and maim our children? And, and there's, no, there's no particular reason anyone has to own a pit bull in a community of men, women, and children. There's plenty of other dog breeds. So I hear that all the time. It's not the dog, it, it's the owner. Even if that's true, I don't care because the danger exists regardless of the underlying cause. Unless you can tell me you have a way of preventing pit bulls from being made dangerous by bad owners, then, then I, don't want them, I don't want them in my community. And I don't think anybody can make that argument. Okay, let's take a look at Rumble. Rumble, Rumble, Rumble. <laughs> uh, this is not a Rumble rant, but it's funny enough. I'll, I'll read it anyway uh, on, on Rumble. A job done well says, I get the impression Branka's ex-wife owned a pit bull. Uh, she did not. She owned quite a number of dogs, but pit bull, and they were all harmless. Um, but uh, a pit bull was not amongst them. I did say we had a uh, we had an Australian cattle dog. That was uh, that dog was smarter than a lot of people I know. Very very smart dog. Let's see. Yeah, people are saying it's uh, the image was blurry. Is it still blurry? It looks very clear to me on my end at present. Um, there we go. All right, a uh, quick look again at the members. Let's see. Oh, Tony D, Law and Self-Defense member Tony D. Is there any database that tracks the type of dogs in attacks injuries? I, I don't know. I mean, I've seen data, uh, but I, I haven't dug deep to know if the data is any good. And by the way, any, any kind of ban or prohibition should be based on reason. Not, not just some kind of emotional response. So I, I, would, I would want there to be data collected. Um, okay, I think, I think that's everything. Quick look to see if there's any new Super Chats. And again, a reminder, tomorrow's show, Friday's show, we'll be covering a bunch of um, a bunch of gun video, uh, gun uses caught on video, but it's going to be a members only show because I get demonetized every time. Uh oh. Yep, that's not what I wanted. This is what I wanted. Here we go. Uh, we're going to be covering a number of uh, video captures of uses of uh, guns against other people, some by police, some by civilians. Uh, but it's, it'll be a members-only show at the Law of Self-Defense members dashboard. Uh, you need to be a member. But membership is dirt cheap, only about 30 cents a day. You can become a member right now at lawofselfdefense.com slash join. And with that out of the way, folks, I will wrap up today's show right about at an hour. Not too bad. So remember, folks, if you carry a gun, so you're hard to kill. That's why I carry a gun. So I'm hard to kill. So my family is hard to kill. Then you also owe it to yourself and your family to make sure you know the law. So you're also hard to convict. For those of you who are law self-defense members, I will see you in tomorrow's show where we cover those shooting events. For everybody else, it will probably uh, be Monday before we meet again. But in any case, until then, I remain attorney Andrew Branca for Law and Self-Defense. Stay safe.